Iliad. The Iliad is an ancient Greek epic poem and dactylic hexameter, traditionally attributed to Homer. Set during the Trojan War, the ten-year siege of the city of Troy by a coalition of Greek states, it tells of the battles and events during the weeks of a quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles. Although the story covers only a few weeks in the final year of the war, the Iliad mentions or alludes to many of the Greek legends about the siege. The earlier events, such as the gathering of warriors for the siege, the cause of the war, and related concerns tend to appear near the beginning. Then the epic narrative takes up events prophesied for the future, such as Achilles' looming death and the sack of Troy, prefigured and alluded to more and more vividly, so that when it reaches an end, the poem has told a more or less complete tale of the Trojan War. The Iliad is paired with something of a sequel, the Odyssey, also attributed to Homer. Along with the Odyssey, the Iliad is among the oldest extant works of Western literature, and its written version is usually dated to around the 8th century BC. Recent statistical modeling based on language evolution has found it to date to 760-710 BC. In the modern Vulgate, accepted version, the Iliad contains 15,693 lines. It is written in Homeric Greek, a literary amalgam of Ionic Greek and other dialects. Synopsis Note, book numbers are in parentheses and come before the synopsis of the book. 1. After an invocation to the Muses, the story launches in Medias Res, in the middle of things, towards the end of the Trojan War between the Trojans and the besieging Greeks. Chryses, a Trojan priest of Apollo, offers the Greeks wealth for the return of his daughter Chrysas, a captive of Agamemnon, the Greek leader. Although most of the Greek army is in favor of the offer, Agamemnon refuses. Chryses prays for Apollo's help, and Apollo causes a plague throughout the Greek army. After nine days of plague, Achilles, the leader of the Myrmidon contingent, calls an assembly to solve the plague problem. Under pressure, Agamemnon agrees to return Chrysis to her father, but also decides to take Achilles as captive, Bryces, as compensation. Angered, Achilles declares that he and his men will no longer fight for Agamemnon, but will go home. Odysseus takes a ship and brings Chrysis to her father, whereupon Apollo ends the plague. In the meantime, Agamemnon's messengers take Bryces away, and Achilles asks his mother, Thetis, to ask Zeus that the Greeks be brought to the breaking point by the Trojans, so Agamemnon will realize how much the Greeks need Achilles. Thetis does so, and Zeus agrees. 2. Zeus sends a dream to Agamemnon, urging him to attack the city. Agamemnon heeds the dream but decides to first test the morale of the Greek army by telling them to go home. The plan backfires, and only the intervention of Odysseus, inspired by Athena, stops the rout. Odysseus confronts and beats Thersitz, a common soldier who voices discontent at fighting Agamemnon's war. After a meal, the Greeks deploy in companies upon the Trojan plain. The poet takes the opportunity to describe the provenance of each Greek contingent. When news of the Greek deployment reaches King Priam, the Trojans to sortie upon the plain. In a similar list to that for the Greeks, the poet describes the Trojans and their allies. 3. The armies approach each other on the plain, but before they meet, Paris offers to end the war by fighting a duel with Menelaus, urged by his brother in head of the Trojan army, Hector. While Helen tells Priam about the Greek commanders from the walls of Troy, both sides swear a truce and promise to abide by the outcome of the duel. Paris is beaten, but Aphrodite rescues him and leads him to bed with Helen before Menelaus could kill him. 4. Pressured by Hera's hatred of Troy, Zeus arranges for the Trojan Pondaros to break the truce by wounding Menelaus with an arrow. Agamemnon rouses the Greeks, and battle is joined. 5. In the fighting, Diomedes kills many Trojans, including Pondaros, and defeats Aeneas, whom again Aphrodite rescues, but Diomedes attacks and wounds the goddess. Apollo faces Diomedes, and warns him against warring with gods. Many heroes and commanders join in, including Hector, and the gods supporting each side try to influence the battle. Emboldened by Athena, Diomedes wounds Ares and puts him out of action. 6. Hector rallies the Trojans and stops the rout. 
the Greek Diomedes and the Trojan Glaucos find common ground and exchange unequal gifts. Hector enters the city, urges prayers and sacrifices, incites Paris to battle, bids his wife Andromach and son Astyanax farewell on the city walls, and rejoins the battle. 7. Hector duels with Ajax, but nightfall interrupts the fight and both sides retire. The Greeks agree to burn their dead and build a wall to protect their ships and camp. While the Trojans quarrel about returning Helen Paris offers to return the treasure he took, and give further wealth as compensation, but without returning Helen, and the offer is refused. A day's truce is agreed for burning the dead, during which the Greeks also build their wall and trench. 8. The next morning, Zeus prohibits the gods from interfering, and fighting begins anew. The Trojans prevail and force the Greeks back to their wall while Hera and Athena are forbidden from helping. Night falls before the Trojans can assail the Greek wall. They camp in the field to attack at first light, and their watchfires light the plain like stars. 9. Meanwhile, the Greeks are desperate. Agamemnon admits his error, and sends an embassy composed of Odysseus, Ajax, Phoenix, and two heralds to offer Bryces and extensive gifts to Achilles, who has been camped next to his ships throughout, if only he would return to the fighting. Achilles and his companion Patroclus receive the embassy well, but Achilles angrily refuses Agamemnon's offer, and declares that he would only return to battle if the Trojans reach his ships and threaten them with fire. The embassy returns empty-handed. 10. Later that night, Odysseus and Diomedes venture out to the Trojan lines, killing the Trojan Dolan and wreaking havoc in the camps of some Thracian allies of Troy. 11. In the morning, the fighting is fierce and Agamemnon, Diomedes, and Odysseus are all wounded. Achilles sends Patroclus from his camp to inquire about the Greek casualties, and while there Patroclus is moved to pity by a speech of Nestor. 12. The Trojans assault the Greek while on foot. Hector, ignoring an omen, leads the terrible fighting. The Greeks are overwhelmed in rout, the wall's gate is broken, and Hector charges in. 13. Many fall on both sides. The Trojan seer Polydemus urges Hector to fall back and warns him about Achilles, but is ignored. 14. Hera seduces Zeus and lures him to sleep, allowing Poseidon to help the Greeks, and the Trojans are driven back onto the plain. 15. Zeus awakes and is enraged by Poseidon's intervention. Against the mounting discontent of the Greek supporting gods, Zeus sends Apollo to aid the Trojans who once again breach the wall, and the battle reaches the ships. 16. Patroclus can stand to watch no longer, and begs Achilles to be allowed to defend the ships. Achilles relents, and lends Patroclus his armor, but sends him off with a stern admonition not to pursue the Trojans, lest he take Achilles' glory. Patroclus leads the Myrmidons to battle and arrives as the Trojans set fire to the first ships. The Trojans are routed by the sudden onslaught and Patroclus begins his assault by killing the Trojan hero Sarbedon. Patroclus, ignoring Achilles' command, pursues and reaches the gates of Troy, where Apollo himself stops him. Patroclus is set upon by Apollo and Euphorbos, and is finally killed by Hector. 17. Hector takes Achilles' armor from the fallen Patroclus, but fighting develops around Patroclus' body. 18. Achilles is mad with grief when he hears of Patroclus' death, and vows to take vengeance on Hector. His mother Thetis grieves too, knowing that Achilles is fated to die young if he kills Hector. Achilles is urged to help retrieve Patroclus' body, but has no armor. Made brilliant by Athena, Achilles stands next to the Greek wall and roars in rage. The Trojans are dismayed by his appearance and the Greeks manage to bear Patroclus' body away. Again Polydemus urges Hector to withdraw into the city, again Hector refuses, and the Trojans camp in the plain at nightfall. Patroclus is mourned, and meanwhile, at Thetis' request, Hephaestus fashions a new set of armor for Achilles, among which is a magnificently raw shield. 19. In the morning, Agamemnon gives Achilles all the promised gifts, including Bryces, but he is indifferent to them. Achilles fasts while the Greeks take their meal, and straps on his new armor, and heaves his great spear. His horse Xanthus prophesies to Achilles his death. Achilles drives his chariot into battle. 20. 
Zeus lifts the ban on the gods' interference, and the gods freely intervene on both sides. The onslaught of Achilles, burning with rage and grief, is terrible, and he slays many. 21. Driving the Trojans before him, Achilles cuts off half in the river Scamandros and proceeds to slaughter them and fills the river with the dead. The river, angry at the killing, confronts Achilles, but is beaten back by Hephaestus' firestorm. The gods fight among themselves. The great gates of the city are open to receive the fleeing Trojans, and Apollo leads Achilles away from the city by pretending to be a Trojan. 22. When Apollo reveals himself to Achilles, the Trojans had retreated into the city, all except for Hector, who, having twice ignored the counsels of Polydamus, feels the shame of rout and resolves to face Achilles, in spite of the pleas of Priam and Hecuba, his parents. When Achilles approaches, Hector's will fails him, and he is chased around the city by Achilles. Finally, Athena tricks him to stop running, and he turns to face his opponent. After a brief duel, Achilles stabs Hector through the neck. Before dying, Hector reminds Achilles that he is fated to die in the war as well. Achilles takes Hector's body and dissnares it. 23. The ghost of Patroclus comes to Achilles in a dream and urges the burial of his body. The Greeks hold a day of funeral games, and Achilles gives out the prizes. 24. Dismayed by Achilles' continued abuse of Hector's body, Zeus decides that it must be returned to Priam. Led by Hermes, Priam takes a wagon out of Troy, across the plains, and enters the Greek camp unnoticed. He grasps Achilles by the knees and begs to have his son's body. Achilles is moved to tears, and the two lament their losses in the war. After a meal, Priam carries Hector's body back into Troy. Hector is buried, and the city mourns. The Major Characters The many characters of the Iliad are catalogued. The latter half of Book 2, the Catalog of Ships, lists commanders and cohorts. Battle scenes feature quickly slain minor characters. Achaeans The Achaeans, Achaio, also called Hellenes, Greeks, Danaans, Danai, or Argives, Argia. Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, leader of the Greeks. Achilles, leader of the Myrmidons, hero, son of a divine mother, Thetis. Odysseus, king of Ithaca, Greek commander. Ajax the Greater, son of Telamon and king of Salamis. Menelaus, king of Sparta, husband of Helen and brother of Agamemnon. Diomedes, son of Tydeus, king of Argos. Ajax the Lesser, son of Orleus, often partner of Ajax the Greater. Patroclus, Achilles' closest companion. Nestor, king of Pylos, and trusted advisor to Agamemnon. Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, leader of the Greeks, Achilles, leader of the Myrmidons, hero, son of a divine mother, Thetis, Odysseus, king of Ithaca, Greek commander, Ajax the Greater, son of Telamon and king of Salamis, Menelaus, king of Sparta, husband of Helen and brother of Agamemnon, Diomedes, son of Tydeus, king of Argos, Ajax the Lesser, son of Orleus, often partner of Ajax the Greater, Patroclus. Achilles' closest companion, Nestor, king of Pylos, and trusted advisor to Agamemnon. Achilles and Patroclus Much debate has surrounded the nature of the relationship of Achilles and Patroclus, as to whether it can be described as a homoerotic one or not. Classical and Hellenistic Athenian scholars perceived it as pederastic, while others perceived it as a platonic warrior bond. Trojans the Trojan Men Hector, son of King Priam and the foremost Trojan warrior. Aeneas, son of Anchises and Aphrodite. Diphobus, brother of Hector and Paris Paris, Helen's lover abductor. Priam, the aged king of Troy. Polydamus, a prudent commander whose advice is ignored. He is Hector's foil. Agenor, a Trojan warrior, son of Antenor, who attempts to fight Achilles. Book XXI. Sarpedon, son of Zeus, killed by Patroclus. Was friend of Glaucus and co-leader of the Lycians, fought for the Trojans. Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, friend of Sarpedon and co-leader of the Lycians, fought for the Trojans. Euphorbus, first Trojan warrior to wound Patroclus. 
Dolan, A Spy Upon the Greek Camp, Book X. Antenor, King Priam's advisor, who argues for returning Helen to end the war. Polydorus, son of Priam and Laiotho. Pandarus, famous archer and son of Lycaon, Hector, son of King Priam and the foremost Trojan warrior, Aeneas, son of Anchises and Aphrodite, Diphobus, brother of Hector and Paris, Paris, Helen's lover abductor, Priam, the aged king of Troy, Polydemus, a prudent commander whose advice is ignored. He is Hector's foil, Agenor, a Trojan warrior, son of Antenor, who attempts to fight Achilles, Book XXI, Sarpedon, son of Zeus, killed by Patroclus. Was friend of Glaucus and co-leader of the Lycians, fought for the Trojans, Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, friend of Sarpedon and co-leader of the Lycians, fought for the Trojans, Euphorbus, first Trojan warrior to wound Patroclus, Dolan, a spy upon the Greek camp, Book X, Antenor, King Priam's advisor, who argues for returning Helen to end the war, Polydorus, son of Priam and Laiotho, Pandarus, famous archer and son of Lycaon, the Trojan women, Hecuba, Acabe, Hecabe, Priam's wife, mother of Hector, Cassandra, Paris, and others. Helen, Helene, daughter of Zeus. Menelaus's wife. Espoused first to Paris, then to Diphobus. Her abduction by Paris precipitated the war. Andromach, Hector's wife, mother of Astyanax. Cassandra, Priam's daughter. Courted by Apollo, who bestows the gift of prophecy to her. Upon being rejected by her, he curses her, and her warnings of Trojan doom go unheeded. Bryces, a Trojan woman captured by the Greeks. She was Achilles' prize of the Trojan War. Hecuba, Acabe, Hecabe, Priam's wife, mother of Hector, Cassandra, Paris, and others. Helen, Helene, daughter of Zeus. Menelaus's wife. Espoused first to Paris, then to Diphobus. Her abduction by Paris precipitated the war. Andromach, Hector's wife, mother of Astyanax, Cassandra, Priam's daughter. Courted by Apollo, who bestows the gift of prophecy to her. Upon being rejected by her, he curses her, and her warnings of Trojan doom go unheeded. Bryces, a Trojan woman captured by the Greeks. She was Achilles' prize of the Trojan War. Gods in the literary Trojan War of the Iliad, the Olympic gods, goddesses, and demigods fight and play great roles in human warfare. Unlike practical Greek religious observance, Homer's portrayals of them suited his narrative purpose, being very different from the polytheistic ideals Greek society used. To wit, the classical era historian Herodotus says that Homer, and his contemporary, the poet Hesiod, were the first artists to name and describe their appearance and characters. In Greek God's Human Lives, What We Can Learn From Myths, Mary Lefkowitz discusses the relevance of divine action in the Iliad, attempting to answer the question of whether or not divine intervention is a discrete occurrence, for its own sake, or if such godly behaviors are mere human character metaphors. The intellectual interest of classic-era authors, such as Thucydides and Plato, was limited to their utility as a way of talking about human life rather than a description or a truth, because if the gods remain religious figures, rather than human metaphors, their existence without the foundation of either dogma or a Bible of faith, then allowed Greek culture the intellectual breadth and freedom to conjure gods fitting any religious function they required as a people. In The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, psychologist Julian Jaynes uses the Iliad as a major supporting evidence for his theory of bicameralism, which posits that until about the time described in the Iliad, Humans had a much different mentality than present-day humans, essentially lacking in what we call consciousness. He suggests that humans heard and obeyed commands from what they identified as gods, until the change in human mentality that incorporated the motivating force into the conscious self. He points out that almost every action in the Iliad is directed, caused, or influenced by a god, and that earlier translations show an astonishing lack of words suggesting thought, planning, or introspection. Those that do appear, he argues, are misinterpretations made by translators imposing a modern mentality on the characters. The Major Deities Zeus, Neutral, Hera, Achaeans, Artemis, Trojans, 
Apollo, Trojans, Hades, Neutral, Aphrodite, Trojans, Ares, Trojans, Athena, Achaeans, Hermes, Neutral, Poseidon, Achaeans, Hephaestus, Achaeans, Zeus, Neutral, Hera, Achaeans, Artemis, Trojans, Apollo, Trojans, Hades, Neutral, Aphrodite, Trojans, Ares, Trojans, Athena, Achaeans, Hermes, Neutral, Poseidon, Achaeans, Hephaestus, Achaeans, the minor deities, Eris, Iris, Thetis, Leto, Proteus, Scamander, Phobos, Demos, Eris, Iris, Thetis, Leto, Proteus, Scamander, Phobos, Demos. Themes Nostos Nostos, Nostos, homecoming occurs seven times in the poem. Thematically, the concept of homecoming is much explored in ancient Greek literature, especially in the post-war homeward fortunes experienced by the Atrido, Agamemnon and Menelaus, and Odysseus, see the Odyssey. Thus, Nostos is impossible without sacking Troy, King Agamemnon's motive for winning, at any cost. Cleos Cleos, Cleos, glory, fame is the concept of glory earned in heroic battle. For most of the Greek invaders of Troy, notably Odysseus, Cleos is earned in a victorious Nostos, homecoming, yet not for Achilles, he must choose one reward either Nostos or Cleos. In Book 9, 9410-16, he poignantly tells Agamemnon's envoys, Odysseus, Phoenix, Ajax, begging his reinstatement to battle about having to choose between two fates, Decathedius Keras, 9.411. The passage reads, the translation is Latimores. In foregoing his nostos, he will earn the greater reward of Cleos Aphthodon, Cleos Aphthodon, fame imperishable. In the poem, Aphthodon, Aphthodon, imperishable occurs five other times, each occurrence denotes an object, Agamemnon's scepter, the wheel of Hebe's chariot, the house of Poseidon, the throne of Zeus, the house of Hephaestus. Translator Latimo renders Cleo's Aphrodite as forever immortal and as forever imperishable, connoting Achilles' mortality by underscoring his greater reward in returning to battle Troy. Achilles' shield, crafted by Hephaestus and given to him by his mother Thetis, bears an image of stars in the center. The stars conjure profound images of the place of a single man, no matter how heroic, in the perspective of the entire cosmos. Time. Akin to Cleo's is time, time, respect, honor, the concept denoting the respectability and honorable man accrues with accomplishment, cultural, political, martial, per his station in life. In Bukai, the Greek troubles begin with King Agamemnon's dishonorable, unkingly behavior, first, by threatening the priest Chryses, 1.11, then, by aggravating them and disrespecting Achilles by confiscating prices from him, 1.171. The warrior's consequent rancor against the dishonorable king ruins the Greek military cause. Wrath The poem's initial word, menon, menon, accusative of menace, menace, wrath, rage, fury, establishes the Iliad's principal theme, the wrath of Achilles. His personal rage and wounded soldier's vanity propel the story, the Greeks faltering in battle, the slayings of Patroclus and Hector, and the fall of Troy. In Bukai, the wrath of Achilles first emerges in the Achilles conduct meeting, between the Greek kings and the seer Calchas. King Agamemnon dishonors Chryses, the Trojan priest of Apollo, by refusing with a threat the restitution of his daughter, Chrysas, despite the proffered ransom of gifts beyond count. The insulted priest praises God's help, and a nine-day reign of divine plague arrows falls upon the Greeks. Moreover, in that meeting, Achilles accuses Agamemnon of being greediest for gain of all men. To that, Agamemnon replies. After that, only Athena stays Achilles' wrath. He vows to never again obey orders from Agamemnon. Furious, Achilles cries to his mother, Thetis, who persuades Zeus's divine intervention, favoring the Trojans, until Achilles' rights are restored. Meanwhile, Hector leads the Trojans to almost pushing the Greeks back to the sea, Book XII.
Later, Agamemnon contemplates defeat and retreat to Greece, Book XIV. Again, the wrath of Achilles turns the wars taught in seeking vengeance when Hector kills Patroclus. Aggrieved, Achilles tears his hair and dirties his face. Thetis comforts her mourning son, who tells her. Accepting the prospect of death is fair prize for avenging Patroclus, he returns to battle, dooming Hector and Troy, thrice chasing him round the Trojan walls, before slaying him, then dragging the corpse behind his chariot, back to camp. Fate Fate, cur, cur, fated death propels most of the events of the Iliad. One set, gods and men abide it, neither truly able nor willing to contest it. How fate is said is unknown, but it is told by the fates and seers such as Kelchus. Men and their gods continually speak of heroic acceptance and cowardly avoidance of one slated fate. Fate does not determine every action, incident, and occurrence, but it does determine the outcome of life. Before killing him, Hector calls Patroclus a fool for cowardly avoidance of his fate, by attempting his defeat. Patroclus retorts. Here, Patroclus alludes to fated death by Hector's hand, and Hector's fated death by Achilles's hand. Each accepts the outcome of his life, yet, no one knows if the gods can alter fate. The first instance of this doubt occurs in Book XVI. Seeing Patroclus about to kill Sarpedon, his mortal son, Zeus says. About his dilemma, Hera asks Zeus. In deciding between losing a son or abiding fate, Zeus, king of the gods, allows it. His motif recurs when he considers sparing Hector, whom he loves and respects. Again, Athena asks him. Again, Zeus appears capable of altering fate, but does not, deciding instead to abide said outcomes. Yet, contrarywise, fate spares Aeneas, after Apollo convinces the overmatched Trojan to fight Achilles. Poseidon cautiously speaks. Divinely aided, Aeneas escapes the wrath of Achilles and survives the Trojan War. Whether or not the gods can alter fate, they do abide it, despite its countering their human allegiances. Thus, the mysterious origin of fate is a power beyond the gods. Fate implies the primeval, tripartite division of the world that Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades affected in deposing their father, Cronus, for its dominion. Zeus took the air and the sky, Poseidon the waters, and Hades the underworld, the land of the dead, yet they share dominion of the earth. Despite the earthly powers of the Olympic gods, only the three fates set the destiny of man. Date and Textual History The poem dates to the archaic period of classical antiquity. Scholarly consensus mostly places it in the 8th century BC, although some favor a 7th century date. Herodotus placed Homer at approximately 400 years before his own time, which would place Homer at circa 850 BC. The historical backdrop of the poem is the time of the Bronze Age collapse, in the early 12th century BC. Homer is thus separated from his subject matter by about 400 years, the period known as the Greek Dark Ages. Intense scholarly debate has surrounded the question of which portions of the poem preserve genuine traditions from the Mycenaean period. The catalogue of ships in particular has the striking feature that its geography does not portray Greece in the Iron Age, the time of Homer, but as it was before the Dorian invasion. The title Ilias Ilias, genitive Iliados Iliados is elliptic for Epoesis Ilias Epoesis Ilias, meaning the Trojan poem. Ilias, of Troy, is the specifically feminine adjective form from Ilian, Troy. The masculine adjective form would be Iliakos or Ilias. It is used by Herodotus. Venetissa, copied in the 10th century AD, is the oldest fully extant manuscript of the Iliad. The Edition Princeps dates to 1488, printed by Dimitris Chalcondyles in Florence. The Iliad as Oral Tradition In antiquity, the Greeks applied the Iliad and the Odyssey as the basis of pedagogy. Literature was central to the educational cultural function of the itinerant rhapsod, who composed consistent epic poems from memory and improvisation, and disseminated them, via song and chant, in his travels and at the Panathenaic Festival of Athletics, Music, Poetics, and Sacrifice, celebrating Athena's birthday. Originally, 
Classical scholars treated the Iliad and the Odyssey as written poetry, and Homer as a writer. Yet, by the 1920s, Milman Perry, 1902-1935, had launched a movement claiming otherwise. His investigation of the oral Homeric style stock epithets and reiteration, words, phrases, stanzas, established that these formulae were artifacts of oral tradition easily applied to an axiometric line. A two-word stock epithet, for example resourceful Odysseus reiteration may complement a character name by filling a half-line, thus, freeing the poet to compose a half-line of original formulaic text to complete his meaning. In Yugoslavia, Perry and his assistant, Albert Lord, 1912-1991, studied the oral formulaic composition of Serbian oral poetry, yielding the Perry-Lord thesis that established oral tradition studies, later developed by Eric Havlock, Marshall McLuhan, Walter Rong, et al. In The Singer of Tales, 1960, Lord presents likenesses between the tragedies of the Greek Patroclus, in the Iliad, and the Sumerian Enkidu, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and claims to refute, with careful analysis of the repetition of thematic patterns, that the Patroclus storyline upsets Homer's established compositional formulae of wrath, bride-stealing, and rescue. Thus, Stock phrase reiteration does not restrict his originality in fitting story to rhyme. Likewise, in the arming motif, Professor James Armstrong reports that the poem's formulae yield richer meaning because the arming motif diction, describing Achilles, Agamemnon, Paris, and Patroclus, serves to heighten the importance of an impressive moment, thus, creates an atmosphere of smoothness, wherein, Homer distinguishes Patroclus from Achilles and foreshadows the former's death with positive and negative turns of phrase. In the Iliad, occasional syntactic inconsistency may be an oral tradition effect, for example, Aphrodite is laughter-loving, despite being painfully wounded by Diomedes, Book V, 375. And the divine representations may mix Mycenaean and Greek Dark Age, Ka. 1150-800 BC, Mythologies, paralleling the hereditary basilized nobles, lower social rank rulers, with minor deities, such as Scamander, et al. Warfare in the Iliad Depiction of Infantry Combat Despite Mycenae and Troy being maritime powers, the Iliad features no sea battles. So, the Trojan shipwright, of the ship that transported Helen to Troy, Fee Reckless, fights afoot as an infantryman. The battle dress and armor of hero and soldier are well described. They enter battle in chariots, launching javelins into the enemy formations, then dismount, for hand-to-hand -hand combat with yet more javelin throwing, rock throwing, and if necessary hand-to-hand -hand sword and the shoulder-borne hoplin, shield, fighting. Ajax the Greater, son of Telamon, sports a large, rectangular shield, Sacros, Sacros, with which he protects himself and Toyser, his brother. Ajax's cumbersome shield is more suitable for defense than for offense, while his cousin, Achilles, sports a large, rounded, octagonal shield that he successfully deploys along with his spear against the Trojans. In describing infantry combat, Homer names the phalanx formation, but most scholars do not believe the historical Trojan War was so fought. In the Bronze Age, the chariot was the main battle transport weapon, for example the Battle of Kaddish. The available evidence, from the Dendra armor and the Pylos Palace paintings, indicate the Mycenaeans used two-man chariots, with a long spear-armed principal rider, unlike the three-man Hittite chariots with short spear-armed riders, and unlike the arrow-armed Egyptian and Assyrian two-man chariots. Nestor spearheads his troops with chariots. He advises them. Although Homer's depictions are graphic, it can be seen in the very end that victory in war is a far more somber occasion, where all that is lost becomes apparent. On the other hand, the funeral games are lively, for the dead man's life is celebrated. This overall depiction of war runs contrary to many other ancient Greek depictions, where war is an aspiration for greater glory. Influence on Classical Greek Warfare While the Homeric poems, the Iliad in particular, were not necessarily revered scripture of the ancient Greeks, they were most certainly seen as guides that were important to the intellectual understanding of any educated Greek citizen. 
This is evidenced by the fact that in the late 5th century BC, it was the sign of a man of standing to be able to recite the Iliad and Odyssey by heart. Moreover, it can be argued that the warfare shown in the Iliad, and the way in which it was depicted, had a profound and very traceable effect on Greek warfare in general. In particular, the effect of epic literature can be broken down into three categories, tactics, ideology, and the mindset of commanders. In order to discern these effects, it is necessary to take a look at a few examples from each of these categories. Much of the detailed fighting in the Iliad is done by the heroes in an orderly, one-on-one -on -one fashion. Much like the Odyssey, there is even a set ritual which must be observed in each of these conflicts. For example, a major hero may encounter a lesser hero from the opposing side, in which case the minor hero is introduced, threats may be exchanged, and then the minor hero is slain. The victor often strips the body of its armor in military accoutrements. Here is an example of this ritual and this type of one-on-one -on -one combat in the Iliad. The biggest issue in reconciling the connection between the epic fighting of the Iliad and later Greek warfare is the phalanx, or hoplite, warfare seen in Greek history well after Homer's Iliad. While there are discussions of soldiers arrayed in semblances of the phalanx throughout the Iliad, the focus of the poem on the heroic fighting, as mentioned above, would seem to contradict the tactics of the phalanx. However, the phalanx did have its heroic aspects. The masculine one-on-one -on -one fighting of epic is manifested in phalanx fighting on the emphasis of holding one's position in formation. This replaces the singular heroic competition found in the Iliad. One example of this is the Spartan tale of 300 picked men fighting against 300 picked Argives. In this battle of champions, only two men are left standing for the Argives and one for the Spartans. Author aids, the remaining Spartan, goes back to stand in his formation with mortal wounds while the remaining two Argives go back to Argos to report their victory. Thus, the Spartans claim this as a victory, as their last man displayed the ultimate feat of bravery by maintaining his position in the phalanx. In terms of the ideology of commanders in later Greek history, the Iliad has an interesting effect. The Iliad expresses a definite disdain for tactical trickery, when Hector says, before he challenges the great Ajax. However, despite examples of disdain for this tactical trickery, there is reason to believe that the Iliad, as well as later Greek warfare, endorsed tactical genius on the part of their commanders. For example, there are multiple passages in the Iliad with commanders such as Agamemnon or Nestor discussing the arraying of troops so as to gain an advantage. Indeed, the Trojan War is won by a notorious example of Greek island the Trojan Horse. This is even later referred to by Homer in the Odyssey. The connection, in this case, between guileful tactics of the Greeks in the Iliad and those of the later Greeks is not a difficult one to find. Spartan commanders, often seen as the pinnacle of Greek military prowess, were known for their tactical trickery, and, for them, this was a feat to be desired in a commander. Indeed, this type of leadership was the standard advice of Greek tactical writers. Ultimately, while Homeric, or epic, fighting is certainly not completely replicated in later Greek warfare, many of its ideals, tactics, and instruction are. Hans van Mies argues that the period that the descriptions of warfare relate can be pinned down fairly specifically, to the first half of the 7th century BC. Influence on the Arts and Literature the Iliad was a standard work of great importance already in classical Greece and remained so throughout the Hellenistic and Byzantine periods. It made its return to Italy and Western Europe beginning in the 15th century, primarily through translations into Latin and the vernacular languages. Prior to this reintroduction, a shortened Latin version of the poem, known as the Ilias Latina, was very widely studied and read as a basic school text. The West, however, had tended to look at Homer as a liar as they believed they possessed much more down-to-earth and realistic eyewitness accounts of the Trojan War written by Dares and Dictys Credences who were supposedly present at the events. These late antique forged accounts form the basis of several eminently popular medieval chivalric romances, most notably those of Benoit de saint Moore and Guido del Colin. These in turn spawned many others in various European languages, such as the first printed English book the 1473 Requiel of the Histories of Troy. 
Other accounts read in the Middle Ages were antique Latin retellings such as the Exidium Troian works in the vernacular such as the Icelandic Troy saga. Even without Homer, the Trojan War story had remained central to Western European medieval literary culture and its sense of identity. Most nations and several royal houses traced their origins to heroes at the Trojan War. Britain was supposedly settled by the Trojan Brutus, for instance. Subjects from the Trojan War were a favorite among ancient Greek dramatists. Aeschylus' trilogy, the Orestia, comprising Agamemnon, the Libation Burrs, and the Oimonides, follows the story of Agamemnon after his return from the war. Homer also came to be of great influence in European culture with the resurgence of interest in Greek antiquity during the Renaissance, and it remains the first and most influential work of the Western canon. William Shakespeare used the plot of the Iliad as source material for his play Troilus and Cressida, but focused on a medieval legend, the love story of Troilus, son of King Priam of Troy, and Cressida, daughter of the Trojan soothsayer Calchas. The play, often considered to be a comedy, reverses traditional views on events of the Trojan War and depicts Achilles as a coward, Ajax as a dull, unthinking mercenary, etc. Robert Browning's poem Development discusses his childhood introduction to the matter of the Iliad and his delight in the epic, as well as contemporary debates about its authorship. 20th Century Simone Weil wrote the essay The Iliad or the Poem of Force in 1939 shortly after the commencement of World War II. It has been claimed that the essay describes how the Iliad demonstrates the way force, exercised to the extreme in war, reduces both victim and aggressor to the level of the slave and the unthinking automaton. The 1954 Broadway musical The Golden Apple by librettist John Terville Latouche and composer Jerome Morris was freely adapted from the Iliad in the Odyssey resetting the action to America's Washington state in the years after the Spanish-American War, with events inspired by the Iliad in Act I and events inspired by the Odyssey in Act II. Krista Wolfe's 1983 novel Cassandra is a critical engagement with the Iliad. Wolfe's narrator is Cassandra, whose thoughts we hear at the moment just before her murder by Clytemestra in Sparta. Wolfe's narrator presents a feminist's view of the war, and of war in general. Cassandra's story is accompanied by four essays which Wolf delivered as the Frankfurter Poetic Vorlesungen. The essays present Wolf's concerns as a writer and rewriter of this canonical story and show the genesis of the novel through Wolf's own readings and in a trip she took to Greece. Contemporary Popular Culture An epic science fiction adaptation tribute by acclaimed author Dan Simmons titled Ilium was released in 2003. The novel received a Locus Award for Best Science Fiction Novel of 2003. Yakan Unkerns wrote a staged version of the Iliad titled Destroy. The one-hour adaptation aimed at adolescents, in which four actors play all the major characters, was workshopped and read to the public at the Kennedy Center 2002 New Visions New Voices Festival, premiered in 2003 at Honolulu Theater for Youth, and published by Play Scripts Incorporated. A loose film adaptation of the Iliad, Troy, was released in 2004. Though the film received mixed reviews, it was a commercial success, particularly in international sales. It grossed $133 million in the United States and $497 million worldwide, placing it in the 88th top-grossing movies of all time. An excerpt from the Iliad is featured in Volume 1 of the graphic novel anthology The Graphic Canon with artwork and adaptation executed by Alice Duke. The anthology is edited by Russ Kick and published by Seven Stories Press. Age of Bronze is an American comic series by writer-artist Eric Schnauer retelling the legend of the Trojan War. It began in 1998 and is published by Image Comics. Published October 2011, Alice Oswald's sixth collection, Memorial, is based on the Iliad but departs from the narrative form of the Iliad to focus on and so commemorate, the individually named characters whose deaths are mentioned in that poem. Later in October 2011, Memorial was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, but in December 2011, Oswald withdrew the book from the shortlist, citing concerns about the ethics of the prize's sponsors. English Translations George Chapman published his translation of the Iliad, in Instalments, beginning in 1598. Published in Fourteeners, 
a long line ballad meter that has room for all of Homer's figures of speech and plenty of new ones, as well as explanations in parentheses. At its best, as an Achilles rejection of the embassy in Iliad 9. It has great rhetorical power. It quickly established itself as a classic in English poetry. In the preface to his own translation, Pope praises the daring fiery spirit of Chapman's rendering, which is something like what one might imagine Homer, himself, would have read before he arrived at years of discretion. John Keyes praised Chapman in the sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer, 1816. John O'Gilby's mid-17th century translation is among the early annotated editions. Alexander Pope's 1715 translation, in heroic couplet, is the classic translation that was built on all the preceding versions, and, like Chapman's, it is a major poetic work in its own right. William Cowper's Miltonic, blank first 1791 edition is highly regarded for its greater fidelity to the Greek than either the Chapman or the Pope versions, I have omitted nothing. I have invented nothing, Cowper says in prefacing his translation. In the Lectures on Translating Homer, 1861, Matthew Arnold addresses the matters of translation and interpretation in rendering the Iliad to English. Commenting upon the versions contemporarily available in 1861, he identifies the four essential poetic qualities of Homer to which the translator must do justice. After a discussion of the meters employed by previous translators, Arnold argues for a poetical dialect hexameter translation of the Iliad, like the original. Laborious says this meter was, there were at least half a dozen attempts to translate the entire Iliad or Odyssey in hexameters. The last in 1945. Perhaps the most fluent of them was by J. Henry Dart in response to Arnold. In 1870, the American poet William Cullen Bryant published a blank verse version, that Van Wyck Brooks describes as simple, faithful. Moreover, since 1950, there have been several English translations. Richmond Latimore's version is a free six-beat line for line rendering that explicitly eschews poetical dialect for the plain English of today. It is literal, unlike older verse renderings. Robert Fitzgerald's version strives to situate the Iliad in the musical forms of English poetry. His forceful version is freer, with shorter lines that increase the sense of swiftness and energy. Robert Fagels and Stanley Lombardo are bolder in adding dramatic significance to Homer's conventional and formulaic language. Meanwhile James Muirden in his 2012 interpretation deploys the heroic couplet, the form used by Alexander Pope in his classic translation. Manuscripts There are known to exist more than 2,000 manuscripts of Homer. Some of the most notable manuscripts include Rum Bubble Net GR6 plus Matridi. Bubble. Net 4626 from 870 to 890 AD. Venetus A equals Venetus Mark 822 from the 10th century. Venetus B equals Venetus Mark 821 from the 11th century. Ambrosian Iliad. Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 20. Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 21. Codex Matrincis. Palimpsest. Notes. Vidal Nackett, Pierre. Le Monde du Mer, The World of Homer, Perrin, 2000, pages 19, Eschylist as Portrait Sue and Fragment 134a, Horn Blower, S. and Spofforth, A. The Oxford Companion to Classical Civilization, 1998, pages 3, 347, 352, Homer's Iliad, Classical Technology Center, Lefkowitz, Mary. Greek Gods, Human Lives, What We Can Learn from Myths, 2003, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University Press, Taplin, Oliver. Bring Back the Gods, The New York Times, December 14, 2003, Jeans, Julian. 1976, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. PG 221, 2.155, 2.251, 9.413, 9.434, 9.622, 10.509, 16.82, The Concept of the Hero in Greek Civilization. At home.harvard.edu. Retrieved April 18, 2010. Heroes and the Homeric Iliad. UH.edu. Retrieved April 18, 2010. AB Vogue, Katharina. Kaleo Revisited.
Classical Philology, Volume 97, Number 1, January, 2002, pages 61 to 68, 9.410-416, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 246, V724, XIII22, XIV238, XVIII370, Rouse, WHD. The Iliad, 1938, pages 11, Homer. The Iliad, Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 1.13, Homer. The Iliad, Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 1.122, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 1.181-7, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 18.111-16. Fate as presented in Homer's The Iliad, Everything 2, Iliad Study Guide, Brooklyn College, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 16.849-54, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951. 16.433-4, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 16.440-3, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 22.178-81, Homer. The Iliad. Richmond Latimore, Translator. Chicago, University of Chicago Press, 1951, 20.300-4, Ilias, Iliagos, Ilias. Little, Henry George Scott, Robert. A Greek-English Lexicon at the Perseus Project, His 2.116, Robot Scans Ancient Manuscript in 3D, Wired, The Columbia Encyclopedia, 5th Edition, 1994, Pages 173, Porter, John. The Iliad as Oral Formulaic Poetry, May 8, 2006, University of Saskatchewan. Retrieved November 26, 2007, Lord, Albert. The Singer of Tales Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press, 1960, pages 190, Lord, Albert. The Singer of Tales Cambridge, Massachusetts. Harvard University Press, 1960, pages 195, Iliad, Book XVI, 130-54, Armstrong, James I. The Arming Motif in the Iliad. The American Journal of Philology, Volume 79, Number 4. 1958, pages 337-54, Tui, Peter. Reading Epic, An Introduction to the Ancient Narrative. New Fetter Lane, London. Routledge, 1992, Iliad 3.45-50, Iliad 59-65, Keegan, John. A History of Warfare, 1993, pages 248, Iliad 6.6, .6, K.L., Tomas. Sailing the Wine Dark Sea, Why the Greeks Matter, 2003, London, J.E. Soldiers and Ghosts, 2005, pages 36, London, J.E. Soldiers and Ghosts. 2005, pages 22-3, Iliad. 4.473-83, Latimore, Translator, London, J.E. Soldiers and Ghosts, 2005, pages 51, 5.17, Iliad. 7.237-43, Latimore, Translator, London, J.E. Soldiers and Ghosts, 2005, pages 240. A large amount of the citations and argumentation in this section of the article must be ultimately attributed to, London, J.E. Soldiers and Ghosts, A History of Battle in Classical Antiquity. New Haven, Connecticut, Yale U.P., 2005, 
Greek Warfare, Myth and Realities Hans Van Wies, pages 249, Bruce B. Lawrence and Asia Kareem, 2008. On Violence, A Reader. Duke University Press. Pages 377. ISBN 978-0-8223-3769-0. IMDb. All-time worldwide box office grosses, box office mojo, a thousand ships, 2001, ISBN 1-58240-200-0, Sacrifice, 2004, ISBN 1-58240-360-0, Betrayal, Part 1, 2008, ISBN 978-1-58240-845-3. Oswald, Alice, 2011. Memorial, An Excavation of the Iliad. London, Faber and Faber. ISBN 9780571274161. Holland, Tom, October 17, 2011. The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller slash Memorial by Alice Oswald. Serving the Riptide of All Things Homeric. The New Statesman. London, New Statesman. Retrieved June 1, 2012. Callaway, Kate, October 2, 2011. Memorial by Alice Oswald, Review. The Observer, London, Guardian News and Media Limited. Retrieved June 1, 2012. Higgins, Charlotte, October 28, 2011. The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller, and more, Review. The Guardian, London. Guardian News and Media Limited. Retrieved June 1, 2012. Flood, Allison, October 28, 2011. T.S. Eliot Prize 2011 Shortlist Revealed. The Guardian, London, Guardian News and Media Limited. Retrieved June 1, 2012. Waters, Florence, December 6, 2011. Poet withdraws from T.S. Eliot Prize over sponsorship. The Telegraph, London. Telegraph Media Group Limited. Retrieved February 13, 2012. Flood, Allison, December 6, 2011. Alice Oswald withdraws from T.S. Eliot Prize in protest at sponsor Orem. The Guardian, London, Guardian News and Media Limited. Retrieved February 13, 2012. Oswald, Alice, December 12, 2011. Why I pulled out of the T.S. Eliot Poetry Prize. The Guardian, London, Guardian News and Media Limited. Retrieved February 13, 2012. The Oxford Guide to English Literature in Translation, pages 351. The Oxford Guide to English Literature in Translation, pages 352. The Oxford Guide to English Literature in Translation, pages 354. OCLC 722,287,142. Bird, Grim D. 2010. Multitextuality in the Homeric Iliad, The Witness of the Ptolemaic Papyr. Washington, D.C. Center for Hellenic Studies. ISBN 0 674 